to the praise team and for leading us in music. And, um, you know, the, uh, always looking for new and, and wonderful talent for the praise team. If you have a gift or a desire, teenagers, uh, adults, sing, play an instrument, talk to Willard, talk to somebody up here. They would love to um, break you in and get you going. They have a wonderful time together. Well, we, uh, we come to an interesting narrative, an interesting story in the life of Jesus, don't we? Jesus walking on the water. Now, I promise you, I did not look ahead to the weather forecast and choose this topic, choose this passage because of all the rain we got yesterday or of all the rain we're going to get this week. But Mark places it here, and we'll see in a minute, in a very strategic place in telling the gospel story. Now, we have uh, interpreted in our culture, or I think we use Jesus walking on the water in different ways today, maybe to talk about different people. You may not, one, be a country music fan. I'm semi. I don't listen to the stuff today too much. But back in the 90s, uh, Randy Travis was pretty popular, and he sang a song that was called, He Walks, or I Thought, He Walked on Water. I don't know if anybody remembered that. But what the song was about, he wrote it about his grandfather and how he as a little boy, a preschooler, and an early child just uh, loved being around his granddad, all the, the wisdom he got and, and how granddads can be, all the games that he played with, um, uh, with him as his grandchild, how creative he was, the great stories he had, and he would sing about that relationship, and he'd always have the phrase, you know, I thought that he walked on water, and just how devastated he was as a little boy when his grandfather passed away, and uh, very heartfelt at the end, I just thought that he walked on water. And so sometimes we apply, even those of us or those that don't know Jesus or haven't accepted Christ as Lord, sometimes we'll use that phrase to describe a person that, that we just think are extraordinary in our life, an extraordinary person, an extraordinary personality. We'll say, man, I just think or thought that person walked on water. Maybe you've heard that or have said that. We also use that phrase for somebody on the other end of the personality spectrum, don't we? Maybe it's somebody that we feel thinks too highly of themselves. Somebody that we think is uh, maybe a little arrogant. Uh, maybe somebody that we think that are, are very audacious saying things about themselves, saying things about a situation, trying to run a group of people or dictating a group of people, and we'll say sarcastically, who does he or she think they are? I think they must think that they can walk on water. Maybe you've heard the phrase used that way, or maybe you have said it that way as well. Or as believers, to magnify the deity of Jesus, that Jesus truly is the Son of God, will sometimes in a cute way try to quote or use Jesus walking on water. Have you seen the marquee sign out here that we put on the corner? The little phrases we put out there? Well, look at it if you haven't got it in your mind right now. One of them says, for the summer, our lifeguard walks on water. Our lifeguard walks on water. In other words, our, who we worship, uh, who we serve, Jesus, you know, he's different than any other human being. He walks on water. Now, these are, I think, very ways to attempt to, to interpret this miracle of Jesus. And really, through the ages of biblical scholars and Christians who have studied Scripture, uh, this has been a tough one to interpret. Or we think, why is this in the gospel? 
why is this, um, this narrative about Jesus in our human minds doing something that's so scientifically impossible? Why is it there? This defies gravity, doesn't it? I mean, how many, maybe you as a little kid or, or a teenager or whatever, did you ever go to the pool and say, well, I'm going to walk on water and try that out? And, you know, we go right to the bottom. You know, it's just we've never seen anybody do this. Well, to really understand why Mark puts this in the gospel and the gospel truths of this passage, you know, we're going to retell this story. Jesus did walk on water. That is the miracle. That is a fact because he was the son of God. But the meaning of this story, it's, it's not to discover that Jesus being God does this supernatural display, but the real miracle of this story, why Mark has it in here, is that Jesus cares and rescues his disciples no matter what it takes. That's why the story is in the gospel. And let's see what it says. First of all, at the beginning of what Chuck read to you from the sixth chapter of Mark, Jesus has just feed, finished feeding the 5,000. He's got this multitude in front of him. And so he sends his disciples away. He tells them to get in the boat and go again to the other side of the lake, trying to escape these crowds. And Jesus says, I'll stay back and I will dismiss the crowd in an orderly fashion. And he does that, so he gets the crowd, you know, it's kind of like, you know, no more encores, you know, the, the, the concert's over, <laughs> the worship's over, time to go home, and they go home. Then the Bible says, Jesus goes by himself up on the mountaintop to pray. And he goes up there and he prays all night. He needs some time by himself to, uh, you know, maybe pray, get a, a vision from God. Pray and, and be refueled. Pray and, and figure out all that's going on and what God wants him to do next. Now, I think that's significant in this story because Jesus' life, as we read through Mark, continually, in fact, it can't stress enough our need for prayer in living out this Christian life. In other words, it says if Jesus needs to pause and pray, Jesus needs to pause and take time for himself and pray all night. Don't we as his followers need to do even more? We can't get through life. We can't get through the difficulties. We can't see what God wants us to do next unless we take time to pray and spend time with, with uh, God as well. Jesus prays all night before he decides who his disciples will be. Jesus prays all night but before he goes and he walks on the water to help the disciples. Jesus prays all night in the Garden of Gethsemane before he has to father the follow the Father's will to the cross, something that he just humanly does not want to do. He stresses our need for prayer if we're going to receive a personal vision from God, a direction of what God wants us to do in our life. And he stresses the power and need for prayer if we're going to decide what God wants us to do as church as the body of Christ. His prayer life just emphasizes the need for our relationship with the Heavenly Father to fuel our ministry efforts. Our neighborhood cookouts are not going to reach the desire that God wants them unless we pray this week for them. We need to be praying. Chuck asked you to do that. We need to pray, and then we need to put feet to our prayers and invite people to come and be here to welcome them and share with them the love of Christ. So it tells us this great need for prayer. Now, the story shifts at this point, and 
And the Bible even indicates that while Jesus is praying, while he's refueling, while he's reconnecting with the Father, while he's getting direction, he senses, he knows, he sees, he visions that his disciples are in trouble. Even in the midst of his prayer. I think sometimes when we pray as individuals, we wonder, can a a, a Lord as great as Jesus, with all that he has to worry about, with all the prayers he's receiving about some essential things in people's lives, does he care about little old me? Does he care about my little prayers? Does he care about when I'm in trouble, when I'm distressed, when, when I'm questioning Does he care about what I'm going through in the scope of all that's going on in this world? This story shares with us, yes, he does. Somehow, the miraculous power of Jesus, the Son of God, he senses, he knows, he sees, he cares when you, little old you, needs him. And he does. Why do the disciples need him? The scene shifts from the mountainside out to the sea. And we find the disciples fighting and rowing, the Bible says, against a strong wind. The disciples have discovered all of a sudden with those winds that come up that we've talked about before that they're having trouble getting anywhere. They're rowing and rowing and rowing and they ain't going nowhere. If they were on in a vehicle or on a bicycle, they'd be spinning their wheels. Have you ever discovered yourself in the journey of your life? Maybe you're going through something now. Maybe you've gone through something. But you felt like you were just rowing against a strong wind. (laughs) You were trying. You were struggling. You were doing your best. You thought you were doing all, taking all the right steps and doing all the right things and making all the right decisions. But you get up day after day and you say to yourself, Whew, man, it's like I'm rowing against a strong wind. I'm just not getting anywhere. Bob Seeger, um, if you didn't like Randy Travis, maybe you like Bob Seeger. I like Bob Seeger. Bob Seeger sings a song back in the 70s, right? It was in Forrest Gump and some other movies you may have heard. I'm running against the wind. Remember that? I'm running against the wind. And he talks about how he was a young man and a middle-aged man, now an older man. And he says, I'm older now and still running against the wind. Maybe you feel stuck in life at the moment. Wherever you are in life, you're just stuck. You don't know what to do next or it just ain't happening. And you're rowing against the wind. Maybe your career is not ascending like you hope. Or maybe you're looking for a change in what you're doing. Or following a new dream of where you work. And you feel like you're rowing and trying, but it's against the wind. Maybe you're seeking direction at a moment in your life that's very critical. Maybe you're searching for purpose for your life. You don't want to just exist. You just don't want to get up and go through the routine and go back to bed again because life seems like you're just rowing purposely against the wind. Or maybe something's going on in your life and you're just extremely frustrated. Or maybe you're bored. Maybe you're complacent. Maybe you're getting into despondency or maybe it's gone deeper and you're depressed. And you just feel like you're rowing against the wind. Or maybe, I hope not, it's gotten to the point where you're thinking, I'm rowing against the wind so much, I just don't have really much hope left for my future. I don't feel like my future holds any hope. There's no joy ahead. There's no happiness ahead. It was this struggle of the disciples and Jesus' disciples today, it was this struggle that Jesus sees, that he drops everything he's doing, that he is going to overcome any barrier, even a choppy, stormy sea. 
and he's going to get to his disciples, and he wants to bring those disciples his presence, and he wants to bring to those disciples his hope in the midst of their rowing. And so Jesus does. He begins, and the Bible says he walks on the sea to get to that boat. And he walks, and, and the disciples almost don't recognize him. They're, they're so blinders on, tunnel vision, vision, working those oars against the wind that they almost don't see the help that Jesus brings as their Lord. But thankfully, somebody, maybe out of the corner of their eye, catches some, something going on, catches someone walking. I didn't say this. I guess I got minutes to tell you this quick story. I was in Denver area one time, and, uh, and it's about catching something out of the corner of your eye, driving down this highway. It's all flat in Denver, even though it's way up there. And something kept, kept just zipping by my, uh, my headlights. I said, what is that? I, I was afraid I was going to hit some animal. I said, well, maybe it's a, I was with his friends. Maybe that's a jackrabbit. I think they have jackrabbits out here in Denver. And I'd go a little while longer, and something had whipped by out of the corner of my eye. And uh, we never could figure out what it was. And I was telling a, a local about it. And he started laughing. He said, oh, that wasn't nothing. He said, that was tumbleweeds. So, so as I was catching this stuff out of the corner of my eye, it was tumbleweeds whipping by my car. And I'd never seen them before. But the disciples, out of the corner of their eye, they, they see and they think it's a ghost. They don't know what it is. And then they realize it's Jesus. And the way they know it's Jesus is in the midst of their calamity, in the midst of their struggle, Jesus says to them words, even though they're scared out of their wits, that calms them right down. That calms the storm right down. Jesus says to them, it is I, have no fear. It is I, have no fear. It is I, Jesus. It is I, the Lord. It is I, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is I, taking us back to Moses at the burning bush, when God says to Moses, it is I, I am who I am. It's I who has power over all of your life and your storms. Have no fear. Calming, reassuring words. Jesus came to them to remind them of God's care. Augustine, the great Christian from centuries ago, said of this passage, Jesus came treading the waves and he pits all the swelling torments of life under his feet. And Mark gives us the image of, of what the storms of life are. Jesus can walk right on top of them, no matter what we're doing, what we're going through. Pain, disease, depression, addiction, relationships, jobs, school, worry, depression, whatever. Jesus is powerful enough, he can walk right on top of the choppiness of our despair and all worries and strains of this life live underneath his lordship. Why did Mark put this in the gospel? Can, let's think back now. Use your imaginations. Can you imagine those first century churches? Mark's writing this in around 60 AD, 60 years after the resurrection. And these little churches are meeting. I think sometimes we imagine those early churches of the book of Acts in the days of Paul, like us, you know, where they must have had a nice building, pews. Everybody came out on Sunday in their dresses and suits, and they just enjoyed church. And no, you had these little pockets of struggling little churches. Churches then were just a little body of believers, and, and most of the time, they're scared and they're huddled in secret and in somebody's house or somebody's place of business to, to come together for a few hours of worship and listening to the great stories of the Bible and listening to the stories of Jesus from those who knew Jesus, 
from those that walked with Jesus. And the stories are being passed down. So you can see this little huddled, scared believers and, and the, the preacher like a Timothy or Silas or Barnabas or, or Apollos. And, and they stand up and they say, this morning, let me tell you what the disciples told me. Here's a story of Jesus. His disciples were in trouble. His disciples were afraid. And Jesus came to them walking on the water on top of their troubles. And he calmed the storms around them. And he said, it is I, be not afraid. And these little churches that are even afraid right now that the authorities could burst in on their meeting and drag them away to prison, drag them away and throw them in the arena to be killed by the gladiators. Do you think they understood the message of the story? Do you think they understood Jesus can take care of our problems? Jesus can come in the midst of our storms and calm us down. And so Jesus says to us still today, Christian, be not afraid. In the midst of the, the rowing against the waves of life, our faith needs to hear that. We need to hear Jesus say to us, it is I, Jesus. Have no fear. And then Mark, I think he also puts it here because he puts this great miracle of Jesus. He puts it at the end of some other great miracles we've talked about. Jesus has um, healed a woman who had a, a blood disease of 12 years. Jesus has raised the dead of Jairus' daughter. Jesus has fed 5,000 people, and it's like the miracles are getting greater and greater. And then Jesus walks on water. And Mark said, what else can Jesus do? Jesus can do everything. Yet Mark puts it in this part of the story because it almost teases us, the reader, because Mark says, yes, Jesus can even walk on water, but just you wait. Jesus, the Messiah, is going to do greater things there's greater things at the end of this good news of Jesus that are going to be more miraculous than walking on water. Just wait, at the end of this gospel story, Jesus is going to, by himself, with the will of the Father, go to the cross, and he's going to sacrifice his life, even though he's one that walks on water and is sinless, and he's going to die on the cross for your sin that you may be forgiven, that you may be changed, that you may be saved. And three days later, guess what? You think walking on water was great? He's going to come back to life again. He's going to rise again from the grave. And he's going to be the first fruits of the resurrection that you who believe will be resurrected one day as well. You haven't seen anything yet, what Mark's saying. You haven't seen anything Yet, these will be greater events that the Messiah will do. And so we're here in 2018, and have you realized that Jesus, the one who can walk on water, can save your soul, can save you? can calm the seas of your troubled life, can give you the hope of eternal life. That's what this story is about. It is a great miracle because it points to the great miracle of God sending His one and only Son to die, to rescue us, from us and to give us hope in the storms of our life. I hope each person here, I hope you placed your trust through faith, through believing in Jesus as your great Savior this day. I'm going to pray in just a minute. Our praise team is going to come up for a final song, and we're going to contemplate that and in your heart, are you struggling with that? Are you wanting to believe? 
And that struggle and that wanting to believe, I believe I want you to know that that's God speaking to you through the Spirit. That's the God that, that maybe is so hard to, to believe and, uh, because how can someone walk on water? But no, he's done greater things than that. And I pray your faith can take you to those places and ask Jesus in your heart or just trust him with your life as a Christian with what you're going through. And let's pray and ask Jesus for that kind of faith. And if you want to make a decision, come up and see me after the service or uh, talk to a friend. And just say you want to know more about Jesus. You need that change in your life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray for, I thank you for all the faith and belief that's in this room right now from your beloved. But also pray for each person's here's unbelief, where we struggle and where we don't tap into your power as the Son of God. Lord, strengthen our faith. May we start by rejoicing right now as we sing in our salvation. And Lord, may we carry it forward by turning over to you all the storms of our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.